I think that was more. That was more than three. Uh, we're so glad that you guys are here. And if you are a first time guest here, let me just say, I know how intimidating it can be to walk into a room that you don't know many people, but hopefully we, you know that our heart is that you would not only feel welcome, but wanted here. We are so glad that you showed up. And I believe that you're not here by accident, that God has something for you today. And even if you're not in the room, but you're watching online or in overflow, can you guys help me out and welcome everybody watching online with us today as well? And we're so glad that you guys are joining us wherever you, you are. Uh, let me ask you this. How many of you like to start stuff? Not like start some static, you know, start some static. Like, like start things. Like a, a new year. I love, I, love, I love to start things. I'm a big starter. A new year is a great time to start things. Um, I, I, love, I love the start of the, the PGA season. Anybody else? Like golfers in the room? I mean, I love it. I'm ready. You see commercials of the, of the Masters, you know, happening. I love the start of March Madness. That's coming up soon. I'm a huge basketball fan, Kentucky basketball. Uh, I, love, I love the start of a relationship. Like, I remember when my wife and I, we first began our relationship, and I love that feeling. I love the excitement, the exhilaration, you know, of all that. You never want to leave. You never want to say goodbye. And so you stay on the phone all night long, you know. Some of you have no idea what a phone is, but it used to be like this. You'd be like, no, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. I just want to hear you breathe. It sounds creepy. I guess it is creepy when you think about it. But I like the start of things, I like the start of a project. Man, I love, I love demo day. I love renovations. I'm like, let's go. You know, I love the start. Don't hear me say I don't like to finish things because I also like to finish things, but I'm just a starter. Uh, I like the start of a new job. Like whenever you, like, like the first day on the job, some of you are like, I'm going to hit the ground running. Like, let's go after this. Let's get after it. Uh, or, or the start of school. Like for me, I went to a new school almost every single year growing up. My parents got moved around all over the place, and I enjoyed like starting a new school, being the new kid. Some of you, that terrifies you. That freaks you out. I don't want to be the new kid. I don't want any of that. Like I like to, to start things. I like, to, I like the start of our church. I remember that day. Some of you were there. It was amazing. It was 11 years ago and a week now, and it was kind of a great day. And here's why I love the start of it, because I got to do everything. I got to be on the greeter team. I got to be on the, the setup and teardown team. Like I can move some pipe and drape people. Like I know how to do that. Like I could, I got to be on the AV team, the worship team. I can roll up some cables. I could set up some lights. Like I got to be a part of everything. I was on the kids team. Psych. I was not on the kids team. Like I love kids. I just only like my kids. Are you with me? Like, I love all kids. They're fine. No, I'm just kidding. Like, I got to be a part of it. I love to start things. I love the start of our church. Um, I, and I, I think I love the start of, of what's happening in this season. Like, doesn't it just seem like something is, is starting? I feel like, like the church is growing. We've had to make room in this house. You know, people are coming. We've grown every single week for the last, you know, month or two now. It's just amazing what God is doing. Like, there's just some excitement around that. There's revival happening in our, our nation. Like, we, we had to grow and expand our, our explore, uh, like, elevate, explore, like, journey that we, we do. And so we, we made room. We made a new space for that happening today, right after this uh, worship experience. That's going to happen week three of that. And we invite you to come and be a part of that now that we have made room for, for everyone who wants to be. Like, I'm just excited about what God is doing in this season. Like, I, I'm a starter. And some of you... Let's say, Colby, I don't know if I've ever started anything. Like, I don't know if I've ever started a business. You know, I haven't started anything or built anything. And I would argue with you that you actually have. Like, you've, you've started friendships, have you not? There had to be a building of that relationship, building of the friendship. Some of you, you're building a marriage. You're, you're a starter. You're a, a builder. You might not have built an organization or a, a company, but you're building, you're building a, a financial picture for yourself. You might not put it in those terms, but whether you are saving or, or not saving is, you know, building a preferred financial picture for you and for your, your family. We're all starting something. Maybe you started a career. You remember what that was like, first day on the job, just nervous. I'm not sure if this is what I'm called to do or if this is where I'm meant to be, but we're all building something. No matter your background, you're building something. 
And I say that because none of us in this room, whatever it is that you have built, a a, a family, a marriage, a career, a business, whatever it is, none of us hope to one day get to the place where it felt more like an obligation. None of us hope to ever arrive at that place in our marriage or in our career or in our our calling that it felt like we were just going through the motions. None of us none of us stepped up to the altar on our wedding day thinking, "Man, I can't wait for the day we feel more like roommates than we do husband and wife." None of us did that. None of us, you know, were building something great, a career and just could not wait for the day that, "Man, like I hate this job so much that I can't, you know, I'm counting down the days until retirement." None of us did that. None of us hoped when we started out in our academic pursuits that we would fail out or flunk out of of college, right? When we first began something and started something like a marriage or a career or education or, or calling, whatever it is, I think words that would describe that moment would be words like, like, like passion, excitement, exhilaration, like perseverance. It could be you know, words like, man, just joy-filled and, and hopeful in what was happening. Tenacity, perhaps describe that moment. We start out like building something, starting something with these preferred pictures of what will be. Like, I'm going to be the boss one day. Or I'm going to start the business. Or I'm going I'm to own the company. Or I'm going to do this. None of us start thinking, I'm going to build this thing to the place where I no longer even like it. I want to build this, but, but yet that happens all the time, does it not? In our marriages, in careers, and I submit today that it even happens in your faith in Christ. Because none of us have encountered the love of Jesus and hope that one day that following of, of Christ would turn into a routine. None of us hope that, that one day this, this love that we had for what God has done for us in our lives would turn into us checking a box and just going through the motions, yet, yet it happens. In fact, just do this. Would you oblige me? Just everybody close your eyes in the room. Just close your eyes wherever you are. And some of you are like, I ain't closing my eyes. Somebody steal something from me. <laughs> some of you are like, I'm going to get my purse around my ankle before I close my eyes. And that's fine. That might not be a bad idea. But close your eyes. And if you have right now, if you've crossed the line of faith, I want you to think back to the moment that you gave your life to follow Jesus. Think back to this just for a minute. And I know that's not all of you in the room, and that's okay. Because if that's not you, I'm going to give you an opportunity before our time's done here today to have that encounter and make that decision. But think back to that moment. If you said yes to Jesus, think back to the emotion. Think back to the moment that you understood, like, the gravity of what Jesus did for you. Think back to the moment your eyes were open to the fact that your sins were no longer held against you. That Jesus Christ took all of our sin and pain and punishment on the cross with him. Can you remember that moment? Can you think back, think back to where you were? What did it feel like? Maybe it was in, in this room. Maybe it was not too far from the seat that you're sitting in. Maybe it was, maybe it was during a worship song where the Spirit of God just, just hits you and you were brought to tears. Maybe it was during a message and you were convicted you know, by, by God's Spirit in your life and you surrendered your, your life. Maybe it was in your car and you were by yourself. And you were on the back end of a really bad decision that you made. You had hit rock bottom and you just cried out to God in that moment. God, save me. God, I'm desperate for you. Maybe it was was some pain or suffering in your life that caused you to cry out, God, if you don't show up, I don't know what's going to happen. And he's proven himself faithful over and over again in your life. Just think back just for one second. What did it feel like? Now I want you to open your eyes and look up here. Nobody in that moment of surrendering their life, of understanding all that God has done, nobody in that moment hoped that one day this, what we are doing right now, would turn into a religious exercise. None of us. 
In fact, I think words that would describe that moment would be words like gratitude. Like, God, thank you. Like, when you understood all that he did, like, God, thank you. I can't believe it. I think words like, like hopefulness would describe that moment. I think words like, like, like thanks and praise. I think words like, you know, joy, exhilaration, freedom. You know, something would describe that moment. None of us thought at that moment that we would want it to one day turn into checking a box and simply going through, through motions. I think we thought that this moment that we are in, this decision that we are making, literally is changing my life for the better. Like some of you can remember that day that you experienced the love of God in a powerful way. Not experienced religion, not experienced rules and regulations, not experiencing a list of, of do's and don'ts, not some classes that you have to, to go to, but you encountered the transforming power and love of Jesus. And I'm sure at that moment, you were more like, let's go. Let's go. Like it's on. God, if you did that for me, if you did that for me, you sent your son to die for me, then I'm all yours. Like I'm all in. Like send it. Come on, somebody say send it. Like send it. I'm going. I am all in in this moment. Like if you can remember, that's what it felt like in that season. God, you've given me everything. You've changed my life. I want to give my life to you. And in the text that we're going to look at today, in 2 Kings chapter 6, if you have your Bible, I believe that's the same feeling that this group of people is experiencing in their faith journey. They're in this moment where there is big vision. They're in this moment where things are, are growing, much like I feel like they're, that God is doing in this, this season. The same things that, that you had at the beginning of your faith journey, they are experiencing in this, this moment. Second Kings chapter 6, let me give you a little context. Um, there, it's about a prophet named Elisha, who is a successor to a prophet named Elijah. And the way I remember you know, who came first uh, is that Elisha has an S in it, which means second. I don't know, that might be stupid, but whatever, it works for me. Elisha uh, was kind of the, a follower of Elijah's. In fact, when Elijah left this earth, he didn't die. He kind of you know, just rose up into the sky. And Elisha, you know, you know, asked him for a double portion of his spirit. Elijah said, hey, what can I do for you? He said, give me a double portion of your blessing, of your spirit. And sometimes I'll pray that over my boys uh, at night. And I'll pray it over, over Gray. And I'll be like, God, give him a double portion of your spirit. And Gray's like, what does that mean? I'm like, don't worry about it. Just receive it. You know, just, you just receive it. Double portion. And we know that God did it because Elisha is recorded to have done twice as many miracles as Elijah. And so God gave them what he asked for, which is a good um, note for somebody in this room. Like, you, you might be surprised if you just ask for it what God might give you. Are you with me? Like, sometimes I think we pray small prayers. Sometimes we ask God too, too little when we're talking about the God who's able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. And so ask for it, like go big. And so he asked for a double portion and he, he got it. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, this thing is growing and it says, The company of the prophet said to Elisha, Look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. It's too small. Now, I want to first say that the company of prophets refers to this group of followers who were following maybe Elijah first. But now that Elisha is the guy in charge, they're now kind of following him. And this band is growing. They're like his own like, like disciples, followers. And this thing is getting bigger, evidently. This group is growing. So they said to him, look, the place where we meet is too small for us. In other words, we got a problem. How many of you know great vision is birthed out of a problem? Great vision. Great things happen from, from problems. The passions in your, your life, the things that you get fired up about are often born out of a problem. In fact, if you ever want to know why it is that you're on this earth, like all you have to simply do is ask, hey, you know, what is it that bothers me and that bothers God? Like, what is it? That, 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 that I have a holy discontent about because that problem that you sense and that you see, you were called to be the solution for. Does that make sense? 
Like, that's why God put that inside of you. And I said it has to bother both you and God, not just you. Because some of you are like, well, it bothers me that, you know, those, that football team down in Pittsburgh never makes it to the Super Bowl. I don't know. I don't think that bothers God. I'm just saying. I'm throwing that out there. But it has to bother both you and God. And so if it does, that could be that you were the solution to that, that problem. Like, for some of you, you could walk into this room and some things bother you. Like, you could see things out of order, maybe trash on the floor, and it bothers you. And you were created to be the solution to that disorder because you're more, you know, organizationally kind of minded. Does that make sense? Others of you, you could walk into this room and see someone sitting by themselves. And that bothers you because you have empathy. You have compassion. There are things that I'll walk into a room and see that bother me that don't bother my wife. And things that bother her that don't bother me because we have two different sets of of gifts. So what is it that, that bothers you? Your gift will always be amplified when you see the problem that you were put on this planet to be the solution to. Are you with me? Shake your head. Yeah, okay, okay. That's what it means. Your gift, right, is is the solution to that problem. And so these prophets, they see a problem. They're like, hey, we need space. We got a a problem, and it bursts this vision inside of them. Look at verse 2. It says, let us go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and build a bigger place for us to live. And so he said, go. Somebody say go. go. And notice he, he exclaims it. There's an exclamation point, like, go. So they had a problem, and they said, let's go to the Jordan. There's poles down there. We're going to take an ax down there. We're going to cut down these poles, and we're going to build a bigger place. And Elisha is like, go. Like, go ahead. Let's do it. Then one of them said, won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha replied. And he went with them, and they went to the Jordan, and they began to cut down trees. And then all the tree huggers showed up, and they, no, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this, as someone who likes to start stuff, as someone who likes the beginning of a project, I read it like, man, these guys are thinking, hey, Elisha, we got a problem, man. We got a problem. This is growing. Things are building. God is doing something great. It's awesome. Like we got to do something about it. And we know where to go. The, down to the Jordan, there are these poles. And we're going to go down there. We're going to take an axe. And we're gonna, like they, they bring him the problem, but they also bring him a plan as well. How many of you just love those people that bring you problems with no plans? Right? When they're like, hey, you know what? You should really fix this and this and this and this and this. Um, all right. So how do you think we should do it? I don't know. That's not for me. That's, you, you tell me. Right, they'll bring a, bring a problem without a solution, but these guys bring a solution. Down at the Jordan, we saw these poles. And if we go take an ax down there and cut these poles, like we can build a bigger place like for us. Let's, let's go do it. And I think they're fired up about it in this moment. I love their tenacity. I love the spirit. I love the fire that they have because Elisha's like, go! Exclamation point, go! And he's not like, okay, guys, go ahead. That's not what he says. He's like, go, let's go. Because do you know how passion catches fire? Do you know how passion is contagious? Like it could be someone is so passionate about something that you don't even care about it, but the way they're talking about it creates passion inside of you. Like, like somebody can say, man, I'm, I'm really hungry, and I know this place. It's amazing. It's got these egg salad sandwiches. It's going to be off the hook. You know, let's go, and let's get some. And you're like, all right, yeah, that sounds good. Like, like we should go to a gas station and order egg salad sandwiches. That sounds amazing. <laughs> and then you're like, what am I saying? That's ridiculous, you know? It's because passion is contagious. Passion spreads. Fire spreads. It goes beyond. It spreads to other people, other places. And so I can imagine that's what's happening in this conversation. They're like, Elisha, we're out of space. This is great. We need bigger. We, we got to go down to the Jordan, get some bigger poles. You know, it's like, all right, you know, let's go. Let's do it. I imagine them running out of the locker room, slapping the sign, you know, clear eyes, full heart, can't lose. I, I imagine them starting like a, a slow clap. You guys know a slow clap? Excited, they're ready to go. So now you understand what's going on, right? 
That's what's happening. They're like, let's go. Let's go to the Jordan. We're on it. And then they ask him, will you come with us? And he's like, of course I will. You got me fired up now. Like, I'm ready to go. Remember when it was that way in your marriage? Girl, I'm with you forever. Ride or die. It's you and me. Remember when it was that way in your job? You came in early. You left late. God, I know I was made to do this. Remember when it was that way in your faith? Jesus, you died for me. You gave, you gave me a new life, a fresh start. I'm, I'm, I'm all in this. God, if your word says it, then I'm going to do it. Like if it's good enough for your word, it's, it's good enough for me. God, if you're telling me to go, my answer is yes. Now tell me where. You remember, you remember those days? Remember when you were so fired up, like serving wasn't an obligation for you. It was an opportunity for you to be a conduit of God's love to people, to, to have an opportunity to make people feel welcome and wanted when they walked in these doors, no matter what they were bringing in with them. Like you remember that? You remember never having to think, God, well, if it works into my schedule, then I'm going to do it. You're like, no. Like, I don't even care if it's easy. I don't care if it's hard. I don't care if I can afford it or not. If your word says it, I'm going to do it. If there are poles down at the Jordan, like, oh, let's go. You remember those days? That's the moment. And I'm just praying, God, help us get back to that. Help us get back to that. How do we rekindle that? You remember when it was, when it was you would invite every single person that you knew to come to church in fact, you, you annoyed the heck out of them. But you're like, I care about you and love you that much not to share with you the hope for humanity, which is Christ Jesus and his gospel, that I'll do anything that I can to, to bring you. You remember that? Like, that's where they were. They're like, let's go. Let's send it. Let's do all we, we can. And so I love this. It says in verse 5, as one of them, was cutting down a tree. The iron axe head fell into the water. Oh, my Lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. Now, real quick, uh, I've been looking at the, the Hebrew and learning the Hebrew on that word borrowed, and it has an alternate meaning, and the, 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 the word actually means it was begged for. And give this idea that it wasn't just borrowed, it wasn't just asked for, it was begged for. So it means, man, I gotta get this ax. I gotta do this. I gotta be a part of this. I have to chop down these poles. I have to help build, build bigger. It was begged for. And here's my concern that for many of us today, perhaps somewhere along the way, we started swinging an ax handle with no ax head. And we keep swinging it over and over and over, and we're not making a difference. We're not seeing any movement. We're not seeing any, any impact being made because we're swinging a ha handle without a head. And for some of us today, I just want to ask you this question. Have you lost your, your edge? Have you lost your edge? Because sending it, and I'm all about sending it and talking about this radical kind of faith that, that we should have and this, this ability to go out into deeper water and to send it. However, I want you to write this down. When it comes to sending it, it's not just about how you start. It's about how you sustain. It's about how you keep, keep going. It's not about just how great you did off the gate. You started out of the gate, great, but now I'm swinging. There's not much movement. I'm in my marriage and things aren't getting much better. Maybe you've lost your edge. Maybe you've lost your, your edge. Married people in the room, it's not just about the I do. It's about the I will. Like today and tomorrow and next month and next decade and forever. It's not just about, about the, the first day on the new job. How many of you know that? It's about eight years from now. Am I still in this career? Am I still you know, on this path? Am I still making a difference? It's not about day one in your relationship with God. That's the starting place. It's about a year later. Are you still as fired up as you were the moment you realized what Jesus did for you? It's about 20 years later. 
Are you still as fired up about pointing people who are far from God to the hope that you have found? Or are you swinging a handle with no head? See, I submit that some of us, we have lost our, our edge. Because it's not just about how we start, it's about how we, we sustain. Like, like in our marriage, if you're like, oh, I'm trying, you know, but it's not getting any better, trying harder, it could be that you've, you've lost your edge. Or in your career, like you're just going through the, the motions, you're going through the routine. Well, I showed up to work. I clocked in. Which, by the way, you do know that that doesn't honor God. Because the Bible tells us that we are not working as unto men, but we are working as unto the Lord. So everything that we do is for him. But some of us are just, so we've lost our edge. We've lost our, our, our edge. And here's what a lot of us say when we lose our, our edge. Uh, we call it maturity. Well, I've just matured. I'm beyond all that. You know, Colby, that's, that's great, but I've matured beyond that. I've matured beyond, you know, lifting my hands in worship. I, I did that, you know, that, that day, and I felt God move in my life, and I surrendered my life to him, but I've matured beyond that now. Like, I, I'm different. I've matured beyond holding a door for somebody and welcoming them into church. I've matured beyond, you know, having a small group of, of third graders and serving in kids. I've matured beyond holding babies. I've matured beyond, I'm at a new level. I should be teaching. In fact, I should be up there doing what you're doing because you're not doing it that good right now. Like, I should, I should have moved on. Are you with me? Can I tell you something? That's not maturity. That's not maturity because maturing things increase in value, do they not? Like if I'm maturing, they increase like, like home value, hopefully it, it, it increases in maturity. Your, your stocks, well, maybe, maybe not. Those are, I don't know right now. Like they increase, like wine increases as it, in value as it matures. Some cheese, cheeses increase in value, specifically Colby cheese, it increases in value. <laughs> That's not maturity. Saying I'm beyond giving my heart. I'm beyond this passion. I'm beyond this fire. That's not maturity. Like maturity, what does the, the kingdom of God say? The last shall be first. The greatest in, in God's kingdom are the, the least. So it's not like I'm maturing to a different level. See, some of us think, hey, because I'm up here, I'm mature. You know who's the most mature? The person that comes in during the week and is mopping the bathrooms because they love God. That's maturity. Don't come to me and say, hey, I think I'm going to be this. I think I'm going to be that. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head up this new you know, location for Elevate Church. Come to me and say, hey, we have trash in the back lot, and I'm going to clean it up. Because that's what I feel like I need to do. That's ma maturity. We lose our edge in life, and we call it maturity. Or we call it sophistication. And I'm just saying, I think you've lost your edge. We've lost our edge. Because when we're young and in love, sometimes you're like, man, well, you know, I was fired up back then, but now I'm not anymore. You know, we're just kind of grown to a different place in our relationship. We're more mature. So you're telling me maturity equals no passion. You're telling me maturity equals no, no intimacy. That's not maturity. You've lost your edge. It could be you're swinging an empty axe handle and gaining no ground. Because you've lost your edge. How do I, how do I know? I want to give you a few ways that you know. Um, and if you can tell by now, I'm a little fired up, so you might want to buckle up for these. Just warning you. Here's the first one. You're working harder, but seeing fewer results. If that's the case, you know you've lost your edge. You're working harder, maybe in your, in your marriage and seeing fewer results. You're working harder in friendship, seeing fewer results. Working harder in your, your career, seeing fewer results. It could be you've lost your, your edge. Here's another one. Write it down. What was once a joy is now an obligation. What once used to be um, worship has now become work. It could be you've lost your edge. When you used to be fired up, about coming in, like I'm, I'm excited about what God's going to do. I'm expectant of how he's going to move in my life. What was once joy has now become, yeah, you've lost your edge. How about this one? Your lack of life no longer alarms you. 
your lack of, like, well, this is my relationship with God. Here's where it is, and I'm okay with that, no longer alarms you, you've lost your edge. When you say things like, well, this is just who I'm going to be, I guess. I'm always going to deal with the same sin pattern. Always going to deal with the same addiction. And you're okay with it. You've lost your edge. Here's another one. You would rather take cheap shots and discredit a move of God than to examine your own lack of zeal. You know this revival that's breaking out at my... Derek, would you stand up and just turn around? That's Asbury. That's my alma mater. Check it out. I just wanted to show you that. Thank you, thank you. I just saw that sweatshirt. I'm like, let's go. This revival has been breaking out at Asbury. It is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. But it's also an opportunity for the haters and the critics to come out and say, you know, I don't know about that. I don't know how I feel about what's going on. Hey, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's like, you know, when you start to, to, to take cheap shots at something else that's happening because you don't want to, to get real about what's going on in your own life. Like when you would rather use God's word as a, a window to point out the, everything that everyone else is doing wrong, rather than use it as a mirror to a, you know, reflect back to you, your own heart and your own circumstance. Hey, buddy, you've lost your edge. You've lost it. And, and not to mention there's something in God's word that says, hey, before you pull a, you know, a speck out of someone else's eye, you better yank that two by four out your own, sucker. That's Matthew chapter seven. You can go back and read that. <laughs> but I've seen it over and over and just... I'm like, really? That's what you want to talk about? And not just say, wow, isn't God good? You've lost your edge. Here's another one. You're physically present, but spiritually and emotionally absent. Like you show up, but you're not really there. You've lost your edge. And I might as well just say it because I'm going to be in trouble anyway. I think there are a lot of Christian zombies out there. I think there are a lot of just the undead just walking around, going through the motions, just playing the, the, the Christian game. Well, I came to church today. I, uh, you know, I, I know the drill. We're just going to, we're going to sing a couple songs. We're going to stand up. Colby's going to say high five a couple people, sit down. We're going to sing again, you know, later. And then we're going to, we're going to give, you know, or, or, you know, before or after. I don't know. We'll see, I don't know if I'm going to or not. And we're just kind of. You just go through the motions and you, I'm going to come back next week and I'm going to do it again. Like you're here, but you're not really here. You're, you've, you've lost your, your, your edge. You've lost your, your edge. And here's what I know about losing our edge. It does not happen overnight. It is a, a slow kind of fade because, again, no one starts something and is passionate about something and is excited about something and say, you know, I hope then one day I lose my edge. I hope I lose my passion. I hope I lose my, my zeal for this. I, you know, we don't plan to do that. We don't strategize to do that. It just happens. One day, you know, we don't just wake up and we've lost our edge. It's a slow phase. So I want to encourage you, though, it does not have to be that way. However, it's not enough just to, to recognize we've lost it. We need to know why. And so I'm going to give you real quick four reasons why. We lose it, and then we're going to shut this thing down and just see how God moves among us. Number one, we lose our edge when we lose our why. When we lose our why. I don't know who said it. I don't know who's you know, given credit for, for making this, this quote famous, uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and take credit for it. But someone once said, when you lose your why, you lose your way. Is that not true? When we forget why it is, that we do what we do when we forget why it is that, that God, you know, you know, saved us and set us free. When we forget the why, we lose our, our way. When you forget the why behind your faith, when you forget the why behind, you know, your love for Jesus, when you forget the why, you know, behind why you serve and why you, you show up and why you, you know, are in community and why you're taking steps in your faith journey. When we forget that, we lose our, our way. Same is true in our marriage. When we forget the why, 
We lose our way when we forget why in our friendships. It's all too easy for us to, to get out of those, those friendships when we lose our, our edge. It's because we've lost our why. Here's number two. We lose our edge when we lose our focus. Our focus. Specifically when you and I focus on the wrong things. Because all of us are focusing on something. But is it the right thing? If so, you've, you've lost your, your edge. Like when you focus in the marriage on all the things that that person does that annoys you. Instead of all the reasons why you fell in love with them in the first place. It's easy to lose your edge. Even connecting to a church, when you forget, you know, uh, to, you lose your focus on, on why it is that you serve, why it is that you, you show up, why it is you do what you, you do, it's easy to lose your, your edge. Forget when you're, you know, lose your focus on that friendship. You know, and you, instead you focus on everything that drives you crazy about that, that person, you can tend to lose your edge. And let me just free everyone up. Nobody's perfect. Like there's no perfect church, there's no perfect marriage, there's no perfect relationships, right? You've got to determine that in the middle of that imperfection, you're going to focus on the positives. You're going to focus on, you know, the good, the good things. Here's another one. We lose our edge when we lose our need. It said that this man, he begged for this axe head. He begged for it. He begged. And once he got it, he, he lost it. And I just want to say, it's possible that the provision of God can cause you to lose your edge. How does that work? Here's how it works. Because in desperation, when you needed God to move, when you needed something, you cried out to God. You're like, God, you got to do it. Like, if you don't come through, I don't know what's going to happen. You cried out to God for his provision. And when that provision came, guess what? Your desperate heart for God left. Like because you weren't desperate anymore. The blessings of God can cause us to be less desperate for God, but we need to continually sharpen our edge and remain desperate for God. And here's the last one. All right, Ben, you can come help me shut this down. We lose our edge when we lose our urgency. When we lose our urgency. And I want to fine-tune this to those of you that have a relationship with God. I want, I want this to to be dialed in, like, based on your, your faith journey right now. And I want to say to those of you that are in that place, you've crossed the line of faith, time is short. Yes. How many of you know that? This is not a game. Church is not a game. We're not just going through the motions. And I cannot afford... In my life, you cannot afford in your life to continually do this. Swing a, a handle with no axe head. And not get anywhere. And not make any kind of movement. You can't afford to do this in your marriage. You can't afford to do this in your job. You can't afford to do it in your, your, your family your friendships, life's short. Life's short, Christ follower. And we are to make an impact while we are on this planet. This man begged for this ax head and then he lost it. It's interesting that you can lose the very thing that you beg for. However, it did not stay lost. He got it back. And he got it back in the same way that he originally got it in the first place, which was he begged for it. He went to the man of God, Elisha. He said, man, my ax head fell off. And I begged for it. I, it was borrowed. He went to him. And it says in verse 6 that the man of God asked him, where did it fall? And I need to ask somebody here today, too, the same question. Let me put it this way. Where did you lose it? Like, where did you lose your edge? Where did you lose your passion? Where did you lose your, your zeal? Where did you lose that sense of, God, you saved me and set me free, and I can't think of anything other than to say thank you and live my life for you. Where did you lose that? And it says that the man, he showed him the place. 
which tells me he could go back to the exact place he lost it and show Elisha the very same place. You gotta figure out where did you lose it? Or maybe when did you lose it? Like where, where were you? Where did you lose your pursuit of God? Where did you lose your passion for the things of God? Where did you lose that friendship? Where, where did your marriage start to break down? Where did you lose your, your, your calling? In that vocation that you're in, where did you lose it? Fill in the blank, where did you lose it? Because you can trace it back and go, I know exactly where I lost it. When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and he threw it in there and it made the iron float. And then he said, lift it out. And here's my iron. Lift it out. He pulled out the ax head and he took it. So Elisha had to be involved for the miracle to happen, but so did this man. He actually had to pick it up. He actually had to take, take hold of it. And so here's what I wanna show you. This is gonna blow all your minds in the room, I know it. Iron doesn't float. He needed somebody else to help him. See, the same way you got in on this relationship with God, it wasn't about you. You could not do it. You could not earn it. You could not work hard enough for it. But you and your desperation realized that you needed it. And the same way you get it back, I believe is the same way that you got it in the first place. You beg God to make that iron float in your life. Like you beg God, God, I need my edge. God, if I don't get my edge back, then all I'm doing is swinging an empty ax handle and not making any movement in my marriage, in my family, in my calling. And life is too short for me to not make any kind of, of forward movement. The same way you, you get it back is the same way you got it in the first place. You beg God for it and then you take hold of it and then you grab it and so this is what I want us to do with every head bowed every eye closed in this room some of you right now you need to beg God to get your edge back you've been playing the game let's call it what it is you've been going through the motions You might even say, Colby, I, I, I serve, I'm in a group. But you're going through the motions. You show up, it's not that important in your life. It's a peace. Or maybe even, even church. I check a box. But you've lost your passion, you've lost. You've lost that moment where you first realized that Jesus paid for your sins, past, present, and future. And it's caused you to live life in such a way that you're just swinging an empty handle. And you need your edge back. Because if you don't get it back, think of who pays the price. of you for your word God how we've gotten so far from your word and so far from what it means to be holy and live this holy life that you've called us to live so God forgive us forgive us we're begging for it back we know it has to start somewhere so God let it start with us 
God, I pray that you would ignite that fire once again. And with every head bowed, every eye closed, there are those of you that you've never crossed the line of faith. You've never had that moment where you realized that Jesus died on the cross and paid for your sins because there's nothing greater there's nothing greater than the moment you and I understand that our sin no longer separates us from God that his son took our punishment in our place and when we cry out to him the Bible says and confess him as Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead because he conquered hell and the grave for you when we believe that it says we'll be saved, we'll be set free, we'll be in Christ. The Bible says you are made new, you're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, and, and it's new, it's, it's fresh, it starts. It's the starting line of your life. And maybe you've never done that, you've never made that decision. I want to give you that opportunity right now to confess him as Lord. If you'd say, Colby, I'm going to make that decision, whether you, you did it a long time ago or today you're getting your edge back and recommitting your life to Jesus. If that's you, would you just throw your hand up? In fact, just stand up. Stand up wherever you are. Come on, let's be bold about this today. Like enough with the hands raised or whatever. Like I'm going to be bold. I'm going to go forward. I'm going to say I'm living for Jesus. I'm going to surrender my life to him. That's awesome. 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 Thank you for that boldness. Thank you for that step in standing up. And look up here, those of you that are standing, look up here. This is the best decision that you can ever make. To say, you know what, I'm going all in. I'm gonna send it. If God went all in for me, my only right response is to go all in for him. And so I'm gonna give him my entire life. It's the best decision and the Bible says that when you do that, when you make that decision, either it's recommitting, getting your edge back or doing it for the first time, heaven is erupting. They're going crazy for you. They're excited about what you are doing and the decision that you are making. And so our church is going crazy too. Come on, everybody on your feet. Everybody on your feet. Let's pray this together out loud. It's just our sign of surrender. Jesus, today, I surrender my life. Give me my edge back. Jesus, I believe that you died for my sin and that you rose again so I could have new life in Christ. And from this moment on, you have my heart and you have my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, everybody. Let's make some noise for a great God.